Greetings from Hunter College. My name is Saborno Isaac Berry, and I'm taking summer courses here in preparation for my BS in Math and Physics over at NYU. Today is lecture number six. What are we going to be talking about? Well, today is going to be very short because essentially we're just going to try and introduce some proof gimmicks. And I'm going to switch between two colors here. All right. So here's how I'm going to showcase all of them. So it's going to be all in this one proof. Theorem 2.2.7. What is it? Every sequence converges to a unique limit. Provided they have a limit in the first place. Wonder who's running outside over there. So how do we prove a unique limit? Well, last time we got an idea where we talked about why 0 was the limit of the harmonic series and why it couldn't be point zero 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 seventeen zeros one. And in the same way, we're actually going to try and rigorously prove this thing. So here's the idea of how we're going to go about it. So essentially, let's... All we have to do is, normally, we would do a proof by contradiction. So basically saying uh, the limit is A. Let's say there's another limit, B, uh, that is not equal to A. Prove that, B doesn't, uh, prove that B doesn't exist. But we can actually do it without a proof by contradiction by just saying the sequence has two limits, A and B. All we have to do is prove A is equal to B. And here comes the first part of our gimmicks. A is equal to B if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A, or the other way around, which is basically the same exact thing. So this is going to be a very central principle. So prove A is equal to B if A and B are two of the limits of our sequence. So, now, what does it mean to be a limit? Well, essentially, in formal notation, a sequence a sub k or a sub n converges to some real number x if and only if for all epsilon in the reals, there exists some n in the natural numbers such that for, oh wait, such that a k is in the epsilon neighborhood of x for all k is greater than or equal to n. So essentially, what is all this blah, blah, blah saying? Essentially, what it's saying is that if we have a neighborhood of length epsilon, which essentially means we have x, any number between x minus epsilon to x plus epsilon. So it's essentially a zooming range. Like how precise do we want to be around x? So then there's some point at which the sequence enters this place and never escapes. It just keeps getting closer. And if we zoom in to a much smaller neighborhood, so x minus epsilon not x plus epsilon naught, there was still a different point 
where there's also no return. It just keeps spiraling in and spiraling in as we zoom closer and closer. Uh, and as we make epsilon smaller and smaller, there's still some point after which all of the sequence lies inside our neighborhood. So, that is the definition of our limit. So, another way to write it is essentially saying that the absolute value of a n minus a is less than or equal to epsilon. Most often less, less than, so we'll use that. So let's say this absolute value is less than epsilon. In the same way, this also has to be less than epsilon for some n. So these could be two different numbers. So we'll say that for n, which is greater than n1, which is in the natural numbers, and this is also in the natural numbers, a n minus a is less than epsilon for n and naturals is greater than n2 naturals a n minus b is less than epsilon <clears throat> so now here what where do we go from here we want to show that a is equivalent to B. We're actually going to figure out another definition of A equals B, and essentially that's when the absolute value of A minus B is less than epsilon for all epsilon in the real numbers, which is essentially the same thing as this. So, now with that, what can we do? Well, here's the thing right now. So, we can make this less than epsilon for all epsilon and for all epsilon over here. Of course, that's literally part of the definition. We're, by the way, we're assuming that epsilon is positive. Because there's no setbacks to assuming that. And also, if it was negative, this would literally never be true. Because it's, you know, an absolute value, always positive. So... Now, here's where the triangle inequality comes in. And that's another one of our tricks, you see? So, here's what we do. We take A minus B, right? Now, what is that? Can't we just add, or rather subtract AN, and then add AN again? Is this anything different from that? You think so? No, not the end, it's the same. Yeah. So, now, by the triangle inequality, which we can prove very simply by just foiling it out, we know that A plus B, the absolute value of that, is always less than or equal to the absolute value of A plus the absolute value of B. So, by that logic, this is less than or equal to A minus AN, absolute valued, plus AN minus B, absolute valued. This... Since we're taking the absolute value, we can just flip the sides around, right? And here now, we know that for all epsilon, a n minus a can be less than epsilon, the absolute value. And for all epsilon, a n minus b can be less than epsilon, obviously when these conditions are satisfied. That is the most important part here. So now our proof is cooling down. It's not red hot anymore because it should be pretty obvious now that this, since this is true and that is true, this is obviously less than 2 epsilon. So by transitivity, we know that A minus B absolute valued is less than 2 epsilon. Now, that's not what we originally seek to prove because a sought to prove because apparently a minus b had to be less than epsilon specific and apparently i don't know my professor just told me analysts like to see everything perfect so all we have to do is set these to epsilon over two and boom 
it becomes epsilon. There we go. That's it, fruit, and that's all we did today. Thank you, everybody, for watching.